Hi, hello. Welcome to another episode of Isaiah's Newsstand. It's your host, Isaiah Edwards. The date is March 18th, 2023. Hopefully this episode finds you well in good spirits with high hopes. Um, as for me, doing pretty good. I had an effective morning. Did some laundry. So yeah, we know we're, we're chugging along. And got my little workout in, so I feel good. Gotta say, I ate too much for breakfast. I actually did donuts and McDonald's today for no reason at all other than I could. Um, which is especially crazy considering I ate a whole pizza yesterday. So, kind of wilding out. But, um, I will say the highlight of it was this uh, crumb cake donut I got from Jupiter Donuts. Uh, that was very good. So, talking about that. <laughs> um... Other than that, we can get to some news. I'm trying to keep it too long today. But um, from CBS News, seven Virginia sheriff deputies arrested in connection with inmate's death. Uh, now, the inmate who died was Ervo Otino. Um, and he died while he was in custody, which is obviously a very peculiar, upsetting situation. Um, now some of the, oh, let me, uh, talk about the deputies. I don't want to forget who they are since they have their names here. Uh, the deputies were, or are, uh, Randy Joseph Boyer, 57, Dwayne Allen Bramble, 37, Jermaine LeVar Branch, 45, Bradley Thomas Dissey, 43, Tabitha Renee Laverie, 50, Brandon Edwards Rogers, 48, and Caville DeJore Sanders, who is 30. Uh, Otenio, who is 28, was being transported to Central State Hospital in DeWindle County, Virginia, for treatment on March 6th when he became combative. Uh, as per a spokesperson for, for the Virginia State Police told CBS News. Uh, let's see, Central State is a maximum security psychiatric facility run by the state. Jail records show Otinio was placed under supervised custody and assigned a, to a medical or hospital treatment center. Um, now, initially he was arrested on the 3rd, and um, Otinio was, took, was taken to an area hospital for further evaluation, but he became physically assaultive towards officers. Um, he was then arrested for charges on charges of assaulting law enforcement, disorderly conduct, and vandalism, and taken to Henrico Jail West. Um, but something that is mentioned in this article um, is that Otenio's mother mentioned that um, he had suffered from uh periodic bouts of mental illness beginning in his late teens but he didn't have a record of violence uh since he since she also told or she also said that while her son had been through or had been brought to the jail during the weekend he wa wouldn't be provided medication to control his mental health issues until he saw a jail doctor on monday and so he didn't get a chance to do that and he was you know found dead um so, I mean, it's obviously, like, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, I guess, alleged or suspected that he was detained or restrained so poorly that in the situation he wound up dying. Um, and that is why these deputies are on charge for second degree murder, I believe. Um, so, you know, we're going to see how that unfolds. But um, it's definitely something that I, de I wanted to speak on and talk about. Um, Obviously, we have a big issue with in terms of crime and how law enforcement can be, um, how things can be handled. But I think something that even I don't talk about too much is just the like the mental health part. We talk about that when these mass shootings come up and it's often used as a you know, defense for the shooters and things like that. But it's not talked about when, you know, you're talking about like, you know, poor, impoverished people black people is what I really want to say here and in situations of like these are real issues that they are also going through but you know when it comes down to you know actually being protected 
And I don't know, I'm trying to wear this without getting too frustrated. Um, let's, let's, let me just read a little bit more. That always helps. <laughs> in 2021, there were 77 in custody deaths reported in the state, almost double from the previous year, according to a report by the Virginia Board of Local and Regional Jails. Seven of those deaths happened because the jails didn't meet minimum standards, and six of them were in jails that didn't have a 24 hour medical care uh, that state reg regulations require. So the tools are already now in hand. Um, kind of more what I'm going to speak to here and in the next article is that when you have officers on the street, they aren't really equipped to begin with to handle any, any person with mental health issues. And they often are put in these situations and they respond with force. That's usually all they can do, it seems. And, um, it's a shame that we don't have more services at, you know, that are available that when these situations come up that we can say, okay, we're going to have some police involved and we're also going to have, you know, some social, um, you know, services people out, you know, to do X, Y, or Z thing to help out here. Um, I think it can definitely add a lot more of a buffer so that you don't have these kind of situations and these negative outcomes. Now, granted, I think in this situation, Otenio getting his medicine might have been a lot more helpful, a lot more helpful, and maybe getting it sooner rather than later. But um, you know, time's gonna tell on how that's gonna unfold uh, with the trial. But I believe they're being held without bail. Uh, let's see here from Yahoo News: Body cam footage shows Najee Seabrook's standoff with police. Advocates say it proves he did not have to die. Um, so this is another situation, um, four hours of body camera, officer body camera footage was released Tuesday in the police killing of Najee Seabrooks, 31 years old. Um, he was a violence intervention, intervention activist, and he was fatally shot in Patterson, New Jersey during a mental health crisis. Um, he was hallucinating. He was unwell. He had, you know, more or less se sequestered himself into his room. He had knives. Uh, he was harming himself throughout the standoff, which is, you know, also a really sad thing. But, you know, as mentioned, you know, with his, his activism, act activis activism, sorry, not activism, the gaming studio. But he, um, you know, there's, he was aware that these services were a thing. So naturally, as this is unfolding... And, you know, the police are on the scene. He's like, can you get this group out here? It's mentioned in the article. See if I can find it. But um, either they say no or they don't wind up calling this group out and essentially just try to handle it all themselves. And they're quoted in the standoff saying like, hey, you know, because he's like, I don't want you guys to shoot me. Like, I don't want to die like this, you know, and they are like, don't worry. We're not here for that. Like, oh, here's the uh, Patterson Healing Collective. Um, it was a group that he had worked with, um, who are dedicated to supporting, um, survivors of violence. Uh, he called members of the group during the standoff, asking them to intervene, but officers refused. Patterson police department did not return Yahoo news request for comment. Uh, police had responded to calls of a mentally disturbed person in his home just before 8 a.m. on March 3rd, according to the state uh, Attorney General's account, when they arrived at the scene, Seabrooks had barricaded himself inside the apartment. Family members um, of his told police he was hallucinating and behaving erratically. Uh, let's see here. In you know one of the clips, he says, y'all are trying to kill me as officers stand outside the bathroom. An unidentified officer responds, no one will kill you here. We're worried about you. And that's a nice line, but literally moments later, you do, you guys do exactly that. And now don't get me wrong. There's, you know, more obviously to tell the story here. Um, it's uh, alleged, at least from what's shown in the body camera footage, though I will say it's like blurred. It's hard to see things a bit, but they say that he lunged with a knife at a cop. And that's why they reacted and shot him. Um, as to what I was thinking as I was reading the article, 
and looking things up, I'm like, why not use a taser? And I assumed they were going to say, well, oh, we just didn't think it would be effective. He had knives, yada, 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 because these guys always have a fucking excuse. But in this situation, they said that there was exposed pipes in the apartment and there was already water that was actively leaked into like the room. So there was a chance that if they did deploy tasers, that there would be like a big, you know, problem. So I at least understood that. But like I said, they always have excuse and convenient reasons on why they had to do X, Y, or Z thing. Um, I, I get it. Knives are a threat. They are, you know, something that can definitely kill someone for sure. They can do a lot of bad damage. But there's a situation where there's a whole gaggle of you in one of him. And I definitely agree with the the theory of, like, you didn't have to just pull out and shoot this guy. You didn't have to kill him. Um, this is a person who, once again, had mental health issues. And I just feel like it was such a secondary thought. And it's just like, no, we need to contain this person and apprehend them. That's what's most important here. And... Um, I think when you start treating people like obstacles to overcome and you don't treat them like people, then this happens time and time and time and time and time again. And when it's something like mental health issues, it goes beyond color. You know, like it's, it's not just a, it's not just a white boy thing. Like this, everyone has these kind of issues. If anything, in 2023, it's just become easier to spot because there's just more tools at hand and we have more communication. There's more education and information available to learn about this kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I, I kind of ram on this kind of shit a lot, but I, people get so upset with that whole defund the police movement and all that kind of shit. But at the end of the day, I think something that just would be the best thing is having more social services available to be on hand to go out on these kind of calls, to be available for these kind of situations. That's not taking away money from the police in the sense of like, oh my gosh, they have... Uh, they, they can't do their job like oh sorry you don't have your like extra fucking tank that you don't need like instead there's more people on the scene to like help out in these kind of situations um i don't know these are just thoughts things to talk about things to feel um you know obviously my heart goes out to the families um it's a shame uh and it's also a very frustrating thing that mental illness is something that is talked about in these conversations a lot but only as like a scapegoat because you don't want to deal with, you know, the issue of firearms in America and how we're just allowed to just have whatever kind of gun we want and pop off wherever we want. And, you know, that's the Second Amendment, baby. Uh, but I guess it's kind of a little bit of a light segue here. Um, we can move on to the next article. Uh, let's see. From The Guardian. Joe Biden unveils executive order to crack down on law-breaking gun sellers. Uh, Merrick Garland, the attorney general tasked with moving the country as close to the universal background checks as possible. So this was definitely, I would say, a dub. Um, You know, Joe Biden came out, uh, announced Tuesday, a new slate of executive actions that are aimed at reducing gun violence and the proliferation of guns that are sold to prohibited people. So I think a really big highlight is just expanding um, universal background checks and making sure that like, hey, like if there is something like domestic abuse on your jacket, there is something like mental health issues, things of that nature, we're going to be able to see that easily and say, no, you shouldn't get a gun. Um, Also, I think they're going to up the process of what they call like naming and shaming um, gun sellers who are not upholding that and who are, you know, getting no, like noticeably called out on that saying like, Hey, you do have these issues. We're not just going to keep them archived. We're going to actually show this information, put this, you know, out for data, things like that. I think that's important. Um, it's definitely a lot of little things. I do love this fun fact that the U S already exceeded a hundred mass shootings this year. We are only in March. Got to remind you of that. Um, Let's see here. The administration argues that this will mean fewer guns sold without background checks and therefore fewer guns ending up in the hands of criminals and domestic abusers. Garland will also devise a plan to stop gun dealers whose licenses have been revoked or surrendered from continuing to trade. So uh, to me, a lot of these things just feel very matter of fact. I feel like they should be pretty easy to get behind. 
though I am certain that conservatives will find a way, um, you know, to fight it, you know, either legally with lawsuits, things like that nature. Um, I did like also the fact that um, there was talk of like boosting the awareness of red flag laws, something that I also think is effective where, you know, you're, you're spotting like, hey, there are reasons to say that this person shouldn't have a gun. Let's just make sure that's noted so that whenever, you know, this person tries for a gun, it it can just be easily seen. I, I know I'm kind of restating that just with this actual name of it being red flag law. But it, it's weird to me that I, I, you know, reading through this article that local law enforcement tends to fight this kind of shit pretty hard. Which, to me, I'm like, wouldn't you want something like this? This is a good thing. But they feel like it interrupts the whole Second Amendment process. That you should be allowed to, to have these things. Even though there they might be issues down the road. That, that That's not our right to interfere with that. Like, we're interfering with someone else's, like, actual liberties. Which, I just think it's weird. Um, but I have friends who feel that way. At least some, not all. Um, but some are like, no, you like, you should, it should be an easy process. It should just be as easy as getting a Big Mac. There are people out there who totally believe that you should be allowed to get any gun like that, that that's, that's how it's worded. That's how it should be. Um, so I'm glad that, you know, at least the administration is doing something like that correctly. Also the idea of, um, let's see, calling gun violence an American epidemic. Um, he also adds that it is an international embarrassment, which I agree. Like, yes, you know, even on this podcast, we cover, you know, international mass shootings and things of that nature and gun violence, but we don't, like, they just don't have it as bad as we do. And the reason we have it as bad is because it's allowed. So, um, I do like the fact that since, you know, the gates are kind of always going to be open to an extent, um... Biden is going to seek to improve federal support for gun violence survivors, victims, and survivors' families. The White House pointed out in a press release that when a hurricane overwhelms the community, the Federal Emergency Management Agency steps in. But when a mass shooting does, uh, does so, no coordinated U.S. government mechanism exists to meet the short and long-term needs such as mental health care, for grief and trauma, financial assistance, um, for example, when a family loses a sole breadwinner or when a small business is shut down due to a lengthy shooting investigation, and food. For example, when the Buffalo shooting, the Topps grocery store, uh, closed down the only grocery store in the neighborhood. So um, I think since we are living in a world where we cannot just have an actual regulation of guns i feel like that's apparently just out of the question in this country we just can't do that um this is something that's at least uh alleviating the symptoms you know helping out the problem so uh you know we'll give uh the old biden a w there the old cadaver's got a got, got a couple of wins in his jacket um all right we got one more thing to talk about before i let you go um you have my normal break here All right, we're back, we're back, we're back. Um, from the Associated Press, Connecticut woman, first non-Vermonter, granted assisted suicide right. Um, so this is a story of Linda Bluestein, uh, who has terminal cancer, and she knows she'll likely die soon, but Tuesday, she didn't know if she'd be able to choose how or when and whether her family, friends, and dog would be with her when the time comes. Um, she's a 75-year-old from Bridgeport, Connecticut. And um, she reached a settlement with Vermont that will allow her to be the first non-resident to take advantage of its decade-old law that allows people who are terminally ill to end their own lives, provided she complies with other aspects of the law. I was so relieved to hear of the settlement of my case that will allow me to decide 
when cancer has taken all from me that I can bear, uh, said Bluestein, uh, who has fallopian tube cancer. Um, I think also she's like fought multiple bouts of cancer, um, which is just always a tough situation. Um, uh, you know, just personally, I know I've had two parents pass from cancer or just cancer related stuff. It definitely fucking sucks. It's really sad. It's a very painful process, obviously for the person going through it, obviously for the family to have to, you know, be there and support obviously you 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 want to be there for your family member in those those moments those times but it's very painful it's very hard and it's not uh, a lot of times a very quick process so it can just be a lot to endure um so i definitely support this i like this uh vermont is one of 10 states that allow medically medically assisted suicide uh, but only one, Oregon, allows non-residents to do it. So, let's read a little bit more. Bluestein settlement and pending uh, legislation that would that would remove Vermont's residency requirement offers a ray of hope to other terminally ill patients who want to control how and when they die, uh, but might not be able to cross the country to do so. Now, also, I think this is something I want to add. It's not like... You just say, hey, I want to off my on switch here, doc. Or you just say that out loud to yourself and then everything is hunky-dory, easy-squeezy. And then, you know, you have a friend or family member help you out or something. It, 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 there's more to it than that. Um, you have to have, like, two witnesses to, like, cure your declaration. Like, there's a lot of formality to it. Um but I think it's definitely something that at the end of the day you want to go through. The, it, it seems to be a very clean process in terms of saying, hey, let's give you the time to think about this, really understand your situation, and if this is really what you want to do, it can happen. Um, and I think just not blocking people from that right, I think, is a very important thing. Um, there are some opponents to it that you know say, hey, we don't want to have a situation where like people are being coerced into taking their own lives um, just because the situation might not be financially viable or, or what have you. Like you do have a right to life and that is important. And I definitely respect that. I agree with that. But I think there are definitely times in life where you are at the end and there's nothing else really to do. So it's nice to have the autonomy and control to do it on your own terms, to do it with uh, your family alongside of you, to to do it with your dog. So I, I, I like this. I think it's a good thing. I think it's good news. I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Um, so, yeah, um, that's all we really got for the day. I thank you so much for tuning in. I thank you for being a friend. Um, if you'd like to help out, if you'd like to support the podcast, and you have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Isaiah News, uh, you get bonus episodes that I put up every week. You get a quick hot link to the Discord, which is free, but you can just, you know, get easy access there that way. And then also you get a shout out once a month. So that is a pretty cool thing. Um, free ways to hit me up, Isaiah News one at gmail.com as well as Twitter, as well as Facebook. You can find me, the podcast, on pretty much all the socials. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, hopefully I see you soon for some more good news. I love you. Bye-bye. Mwah.